I'm Tom McDade, Vice President of the Park Forest Historical Society, and this afternoon we're going to discuss some of the major facets of the initiation and the evolution of the Aqua Center, which has been such a valuable asset to this community. How did it come about? And first I'm going to ask Chris Martin about his role in the Aqua Center, past, present, and future. Chris? Well, thank you very much, Tom. Uh, I was involved in the Aqua Center from uh, the organizational days before it actually opened. That dates back, well, from the time we're sitting here, dating back to those early organizational days. It's close to uh, 35 years ago, as I remember, 34, 35 years. I was involved first as um, Vice President in charge of sales, first of the bonds that helped finance the Aqua Center, then uh, once it opened, ongoing sales responsibility was the sale of the season passes. I was a later president of the Aqua Center and then uh, chairman of the board and remained involved with the Aqua Center until its uh, sale to the uh, YMCA, which I believe was in 1974. Uh, I'm asking John <laughs> Joyce next to me to confirm that. And then I was invited out to the village, I believe it was in 1983, when the village contemplated um, a purchase of the facilities uh, from the Y. And uh, it was my, my pleasure to attend that meeting and uh, tell them they had a, a very good thing in hand and they ought to go ahead, which they did. So uh, that brings us up to date. John Joyce, uh, you're an officer of the village uh, uh, in parks and recreation, I believe, is your principal. That's stress. right. Mm -hmm. And certainly you have had a major involvement in the continuing success of the Aqua Center. Yes, uh, not the least of which is the fact that I and my family have been members ever since we moved to uh, Park Forest in, in 1973. Uh, I was involved quite a bit in 1974 when the village did uh, entertain somewhat seriously the idea of purchasing the Aqua Center and it was discussed and we did some research at that time and with the help of a lot of the board members uh, were shown through the facility and that type of thing. Uh, subsequently, uh, as uh, Chris said, the y, uh, YMCA purchased the facility and then in 1983 is when we really got uh, involved in a big way when uh, it we were told that the Y was not going to operate it for that season. So uh, we did a real crash project of uh, uh, trying to inventory the condition of the plant and in inventory the facility as a business and purchased it in April of 83 and have been operating it since. Now on my right here is a terribly important part of this gathering uh, because she is going to record the history, cause it to be made a part of the record, and that is her business also. Uh, she is the reference, the reference library, uh, librarian, uh, reference librarian at uh, Park Forest Library, and uh, she is uh, very much involved uh, in, in maintaining the archives of the Historical Society that is a part of the library function. The part part, of course. <laughs> Jane, would you uh, please tell us something about your function in the further and about this? Well, I'm not involved with the Aqua Center, but I, I am the person who maintains the local history collection of the, of the Park Forest Library. And I suppose that uh, anyone can, uh, can come to you uh, during appropriate library hours mm -hmm. uh, to find out what has happened here and why, right? Right, <laughs> yes, and we'll try to find the answer. Well, Chris, I think that we'll come back to you and ask you uh, Give us a little bit of the, of the spirit and, the, and the, what happened here. How did this come about? Well, from uh, necessity being the mother of invention, uh, the Aqua Center emerged as a, a not-for-profit organization, and I think it was a uh, very successful exercise in volunteerism, involving not only the people who were officers at the Aqua Center, we always had a good-sized board, approximately 10 to 15 people, as I remember, but literally hundreds and hundreds of other people in the village who were involved in committee work. And um, this is how we, um, we launched it. Um, the um, organizational meetings uh, were held any place we could 
find people to gather in people's homes, public places. When the bond sales actually started, I think we had card tables set up in the, uh, in the shopping center uh, plaza. And uh, this was quite an undertaking for a group of uh, um, village residents to uh, take on the then rather formidable task of raising a quarter of a million dollars. Even though the bonds were only $100 a piece, that seems small in, in uh, today's way of, of looking back on, on uh, uh, the scope of, of our operation. But at that time, when most everybody was a, a new resident, uh, raising families and paying the mortgage were the first priority. So it very often uh, happened that we would sell the bonds by getting uh, 5 or 10 or $20 down, and they'd finance the rest uh, uh, <laughs> at the village bank. And then uh, we had the additional problem, as fast as we could sell bonds, uh, before the project was actually finished, um, people would ask to have the bonds redeemed because there was a large turnover rate in, in Park Forest. And that was a constant problem of uh, having to sell bonds, redeem bonds, uh, pay the contractor, who I think was getting an ulcer halfway through the uh, construction um, uh, program. But it was a labor of love. We all um, loved it. Uh, the first uh, president of the Aqua Center was Dan Hartman. Uh, uh, second president was... Um, you mean um, in succession, you mean? Yeah, second president okay. was, uh, I believe, uh, George... Or no, Fred Marienthal. Uh, I was involved from uh, the pre-opening as... as um, uh, Vice President in charge of sales, and uh, that was an ongoing uh, problem because we not only had the problem of, of selling the bonds and keeping them sold and selling new ones, but then also bringing in the, uh, the season pass money. And um, again, necessity being the mother of invention, how do you bring in enough of a budget uh, on time uh, to pay off principal and interest in an orderly manner? And um, we finally had to uh, offer the incentive plan, which I'm happy to see the village uh, still uses. And that was nothing less than uh, um, giving a reduction on the cost of the season pass if they bought it uh, prior to the opening of the pool, after which the price escalated. Um, so that was a, a dollar incentive for people to bring in their season pass money uh, before the uh, pool opened. So we had our budget for the year. We were able to... Um, uh, pay our water bill, which we uh, <laughs> were always concerned with. Even though we were not for profit, we, um, we did have uh, large expenses in terms of staff. George Wehofen uh, uh, had been a principal of uh, both public and parochial schools in Chicago. He was our first pool manager, as I remember. He was a very competent man. He uh, trained his staff, and uh, it was a pleasure over the years to see some of our early lifeguards who were then teenagers working in college then come back years after married and raising their families and their kids working at the Aqua Center as guards. Uh, so that was a pleasure to see. I'm trying to think of uh, some of the ideological problems, you know, the fierce debates we had in those early days in, in the village hall. Uh, some people were afraid uh, that this would be exclusive and elitist and uh, restrictive and exclusionary and, and the ideological debates waged back and forth. Uh, there was a fear, well, is it going to be a country club? Well. Uh, how can you get to swim if you don't buy a bond? And we had all these different problems and answers to solve. And we solved each one of them to the satisfaction of everyone. Uh, we promised in our charter that the Aqua Center would be available on an equitable basis to all residents of Park Forest. We later expanded that to include Rich Township because that was the high school district that most of the kids in town uh, went to. And equitable simply meant that the bondholder was offered a season pass at one rate, and the non-bondholder was also offered a season pass, but a somewhat higher rate. And so long as the non-bondholder had the equitable right to buy a bond, he didn't feel discriminated against, he didn't tie up his $100, and uh, the bondholder who extended the credit for a period of 15 years uh, while he was waiting to get his $100 back, he got a, a break on buying the season pass. So it was uh, made available to everyone in the village. It was an exercise in democracy. Uh, there, there was no uh, effort other than if you live within these confines and you pay your money and you take your choice of whatever pass you want, uh, single teenager, single adult, uh, family pass. And that involved some uh, uh, debating, too, how large a group could um, be admitted under one pass. We, we evolved the uh, photo pass to identify people. and. Um, that we started to roll. Now, the uh, Aqua Center, as you see it today, and as we drove by 
Uh, we have to compliment the village on, on keeping up the grounds. Uh, uh, they can do a lot of things that we uh, didn't have the wherewithal to do ourselves when we were running at our job each year was to try to uh, keep it going as um, a self-operating, um, self-liquidating facility so that the village had no expense in um, the initial cost or erection of the aqua center. Uh, neither did the developer. Uh, neither had the funds or the inclination, by the way, to get into the operation of an aqua center, although they're both quite happy to have a group such as ourselves, a group of private citizens, form a not-for-profit corporation. And it's at this point that I want to get into the um, uh, creative um, involvement of the hundreds of people in the village who made it possible. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of talent living in any village in this country, I dare say. The, the, uh, our task was to involve them, and along with information on the family membership when they made out their season pass application, we asked for details on their background. What are your hobbies? Where do you work? What are your skills? And if we saw a skill, if someone was an engineer, or someone was an attorney, or someone was an accountant, <laughs> he was on a committee. He, 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 he got right that now. phone call, right? <laughs> we, we need you. <laughs> and that's the way the, the village grew. I, I dare say that's the way the school boards and churches and all other institutions. I remember that activity, Chris, yeah. very well. And I remember uh, so many people that were involved that gave up their time, as you yeah. expressed it. And uh, I think of. Uh, Bob Naber, the attorney. That he had, he that was our attorney for of, uh, many, many years. Time, he, he, he was on the Aqua Center from the beginning right until the end. Um, a very important Aqua Center member and uh, the last president uh, of the Aqua Center before it was sold to the uh, Y. I should mention George Mitchell. And here again, he had wonderful background. He was an engineer with Bell Tell, and he had to supervise the um, the, the um, last construction we had was a major. Would you like me to go through some of the phases of uh, yeah, how the Aqua Center grew or sure. evolved? Because yes, right. uh, it, it didn't emerge um, uh, full blown as you see it today. I have a little shot here, if the camera can pick it up, of the original Aqua Center. It was just the pool that is now shut down. And then next to that, which is covered up now today, we had what was called a, um, a beginner's pool alongside of it, and we had an open-air dressing room on either side of what is now the concession stand. <laughs> we didn't have the big bathhouse that I you have I trust there were right walls now. to that uh, edifice. <laughs> Pardon? <laughs> I trust there were walls on that There edifice. were walls, yeah. which uh, some of the kids succeeded in um, uh, jumping over at night in spite of the barbed wire. <laughs> Uh, so in that sense, it was an attractive nuisance, our, uh, our attorneys told us, and we had to have plenty of insurance to stay covered. But the, the early Aqua Center had uh, a large pool that everybody swam in, and um, one beginner's pool and three splash pools. And after a while, we all started to scratch our heads and said, well, it, it's a rousing success, but where are we going to put all the bodies? Because we were getting crowded. So um, it wasn't long after the Aqua Center opened, the first couple of years, I think, uh, 54, 55 were the organizational uh, days. And if I left anybody's name out, it wasn't by intent. There were loads of people who held meetings in their homes to persuade people to part with that $100. And um, that, that's how we got launched. Um, but the opening, I believe, was in 1955. And um, it wasn't um, before too many seasons went by that we saw we had to expand. And um, uh, then again, there were several years of, of planning, interviewing uh, architects, contractors. Our first architect was uh, Hugh McClure. We had um, a different designer um, in subsequent years for the addition of the adult pool, which went in in uh, 1961. And here you see it over here in this far corner. Let's see if I can hold that up and just point to it. This again was the original omnibus pool that everybody went into, and that was the beginner pool. And off there were the three little splash pools, and that again is the original open air dressing room on either side of what is now the concession stand. So the adult pool, um, again, took a lot of debate. This was a child-oriented village. And for a group of people to say adults have some rights and need a, that, that, that was quite revolutionary, Tom. That, <laughs> that took some doing. 
So uh, mom and pop, who uh, paid to get the thing launched, finally got their own pool in 1961. And again, uh, we weren't satisfied. We still felt that uh, a lot of uh, additional work had to be done because um, the teenagers were growing and uh, they didn't feel too happy about uh, being in the, the one omnibus pool along with the smaller kids who were down in the, in the narrow end <laughs> taking swimming lessons. So uh, another couple of years went by and our biggest expansion then was in 1964 when the uh, last expansion was completed and that was the addition of a new bathhouse an all-brick bathhouse uh, and um, a, an intermediate pool, which um, I think then became uh, uh, the teenage pool. So I think the, uh, uh, Chris, I imagine that you hired more than a few uh, teenagers as the guards or oh, other, yes. Yes. Or there other are functions. Many, many, many dozens of uh, park foresters who worked their way through college uh, working as lifeguards and, and maintenance. Around outside the of their family, the ma their first major responsibility. That's and, correct. And good for their own maturation. I and would say. and sometime it went into uh, just about the third generation. Tom, <laughs> there are some there are some bondholders I can recall who had their uh, their children first work at the Aqua Center, John, and then uh, and then those people's uh, kids have have uh, since done a, a stint. Um, we put together an entry for a public relations uh, uh, exhibit held at uh, a national convention of not-for-profit uh, swimming pool operators. And ours was, uh, by that time, after 1964, ours was the largest uh, outdoor swimming facility in the state of Illinois. Um, and if you consider the initial $250,000 um, bond offering, uh, and then there's no public money involved in that. No public all, money whatsoever. Uh, no, the land itself had been deeded to the village initially by the developer, but it was deeded reserved for, for recreation, and it was it was um, unfit to build on uh, to any large degree. So, um, as a matter of fact, when uh, when we ultimately built the um, the uh, bathhouse. Uh, it required piers uh, under the entire um, circumference of, of the uh, of the bathhouse to hold it up because that land was a bog. It was it was pretty soft. I don't uh, think it was I, unique in the village of Park Forest. No, uh, no. Yes, I, you, you, uh, you actually had a peat fire out there for some years, didn't you? John? That's what I understand. That's what yeah, I and I know the early days of the Aqua Center. Every time it opened, we we have to chase out the turtles and the snakes that came up through the hopper. Because <laughs> <laughs> that was all woods. It Blame it on back. the glaciers. That's very handy. Blame it on the glaciers. Yeah. And uh, let's see. Oh, yes, I was, I was referring to this contest that the, the Park Forest Aqua Center won an award for a, a huge um, display we sent to them. And this is the, um, the finished sketch, as you can see, as the Aqua Center is now. You can see the new bathhouse has replaced the open-air dressing rooms of the original bathhouse, of which the current um, concession stand is the only thing remaining, wooden structure. This is the original pool, which was then uh, closed down. The village acquired it because, it, as I recall, it, was, it, was a, it wasn't cost-effective to run it. Was that right. the story, John? But they do use everything else, the beginner's pool, the intermediate pool, the adult pool, and the splash pools. Um, and that's the bathhouse over yonder. So it was, it was just a delight to work with everybody. It was, it was a classic case of, of enlightened mutual self-interest on everybody's part. Uh, the village wanted the, the aquas. They knew they'd get it in time. They just didn't have the, the budget to build it themselves. Uh, the developer loved it because, um, well, it was, it was great to help sell homes. Let's face it, their advertising material featured the schools and the churches and the aqua center there prominently. Um, and the citizens who who helped buy the bonds and then buy the season passes, um, it gave them healthy family uh, entertainment. And so, uh, I want to comment. A relaxation and, and, and exercise. Now, mm -hmm. you didn't have a child in the home, as I recall, and you gave all of this time and attention to this enterprise. Well, it was, it was a little bit lo like having the lion by the tail, Tom. Once you get your neighbors <laughs> to invest money, you can't let go of that responsibility because you're afraid you'd be run out of of town, you know, uh, 
Uh, so we all stayed with it right up until the time the uh, the Aqua Center paid off all of its debts, uh, either through the through the uh, sale to the um, Y, which ran it for a period of years, I think, from '74 through '82, and then the village finally acquired it in '83, mm -hmm. and they've been running it right up to <laughs> current date. Right, John? Right. I hope that John John Joyce uh, in your uh, good role of. Uh, head of the recreation department of the village and also its parks. Uh, you inherited this operation from the work of Chris Martin and the other good villagers. That's and correct. I assume that uh, you rather got a good, rather good deal uh, for the village when you acquired it. Would you uh, give us some background on that and what your functions were and what you're doing now? Okay, thank you. Yes, uh, we certainly did get a good deal. and. Uh, I think some of the philosophies and, and some of the uh, mechanism that the Aqua Center used in operations we, we have continued and have continued which uh, would em emanate, they're emanating from the, the people in the village. Uh, I was involved in 1974 as I mentioned before when the village was also considering a possible purchase of it when the Aqua Center board was uh, kind of looking for a buyer at the time. and. And the, uh, one of the debates on the Board of Trustees at that time, as I recall, was over the uh, season pass versus the daily fee. Yeah. And there were people in the community and there were people on the board at the time that felt if it were purchased by the village as a municipal facility that it ought to be made available to uh, the residents on a drop-in basis uh, on a daily fee. Uh, there were many of us that felt at the time, as Chris mentioned earlier, that if we did not have a season pass where we brought in our revenue up front and knew what it was going to be, that uh, we were in for real trouble. And that was basically the debate on the board at the time. And as that went on, the Y came along, and they were certainly a reputable uh, swimming pool operator, and uh, uh, a deal was struck there, and so uh, that was... Well, how do you mean they came along? Uh, what was the situation? Uh, did they uh, uh, come out of their own uh, volition to uh, acquire the aqua center, or was there, uh, what was the precedent to it? Well, I'm not sure actually what, uh, how the first contact evolved, but I, my guess is that the uh, representatives of the aqua center board were looking for buyers that would be able to operate it over the long haul and continue the good work that had been done by the organization and and probably a contact was made uh, with the Y. Chris might be able what to time know. was this? Well, um, we all put in about 20 years apiece uh, at the 1974 level when um, we sold it to the um, uh, sold it to the Y. Uh, we would have preferred at that time, as John says, to have sold it to the village. But there were some of these ideological questions uh, which made it difficult for us to do that because we still felt we had an ongoing obligation to the, socialized swimming? to the few remaining <laughs> uh, bondholders. No, it was this question of how do you finance an operation like that that has a, a large operating uh, budget plus the need to amortize a, a debt that was honorably uh, incurred. And the answer is you cannot run this kind of facility uh, by waiting for people for, to pay you a single admission on the hottest day of the year. It's a, it's a guaranteed a ticket to bankruptcy. You had to cover the nut. That's right. <laughs> uh, so we are, uh, formed a rule very early on, if you want to swim, you buy a season pass. Uh, and we did not sell individual admissions. Um, and the village found later on that they could live with that. There was nothing undemocratic about that, since everyone had the same right to buy a season pass. Isn't that That's right. pretty mm -hmm. much so? Uh, what was an agonizing uh, ideological struggle for us even before we opened. Uh, I know the developer was trying to persuade us to make it open to everybody. And we said, thank you, but no thanks. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you gave the land of the village for recreation uh, as a consideration for other swaps that the village made. But now this is our red wagon. As, as members of the board of directors, we've got the responsibility of paying off borrowed money. And we cannot run this facility unless we get the budget in before the season opens on a season pass basis. And bless the village, it took them uh, Several years, was it from 74 to only nine years, right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and then they discovered there was nothing undemocratic and the proceeds uh, from the Aqua Center. I'd like to ask John if you felt there was a, 
a bargain when you invited me out in 1983 when the village was considering to acquire the Aqua Center from the Y. They asked some of the former uh, original Aqua Center board members to come out, and then I went through the roster of the original uh, bond offering, a quarter million dollars, the adult pool, about $150,000, then the new bathhouse and the other pool, another improvements, another 300000 I said, not even considering um, uh, the total replacement value, I said, you've got a million dollar facility here that you can pick up for a song. Just the remaining few bondholders. What and was the melody of that I song? I want to ask John if he, <laughs> if he thinks it was a bargain. I, I know there was debate at the meeting on whether the village should do it, but do you think yeah. you got a good deal out of well, it, John? Well, yeah, we certainly got a good deal, particularly in view of uh, the use that we've seen uh, since 1983. We've, we average about 75,000 bathers a year that use the facility, and that's, that's more than most any public pool in, in Illinois. So we certainly realized we got a good deal. However, we also realized at the time that we were buying a, a major responsibility and a major, a major financial uh, obligation. And with the condition of the facility at the time, I think that, you know, that was the major concern. Uh, I might add that there was, there was a considerable amount of work done even earlier than 1974 by Recreation and Parks Board and the Village Board in discussing the possible purchase of the Aqua Center and all kinds of different uh, schemes were talked about for rates and budgets and that type of thing. So there was there had been planning over the years over the possible purchase of the Aqua Center and there had been people who had uh, uh, promoted that idea. Uh, but after 74, the Y uh, then purchased it and they started running it in 1974 and from that time there was really not any discussion uh, or at least any serious discussion of the village buying it so when we actually did was uh, uh, it was really kind of a, a crazy circumstance because in the in the latter part of 1982 season uh, a number of residents came to the village expressing concerns with the condition of the facility and the level of maintenance that was uh, put into the facility by the Y. Uh, and so it was really the first time that the village brought back on the table the issue of the Aqua Center and at that time it was to try to see what we could do in solving the problem or dealing with the concerns of a number of the members over there in, in the condition of the place. Uh, we met with the Y, uh, representatives of the Y in late 82 to, to uh, uh, walk the, the site and uh, do a physical inventory of what was there and what the conditions were and that type of thing uh, in order to <coughs> entertain discussions of possibly helping them uh, solve some of the problems that were, uh, that they had with the physical plant and were causing uh, concern among the members. John, uh, those, the sure consideration uh, was a consideration for the Y acquiring the Aqua Center. Well, that wasn't be that was uh, between the the Aqua Center and the Y. Yes, yes. We had to satisfy the village yes. because in the original land grant there was a clause in there that it had to be used for recreational purposes, as I recall, on the That's original right. uh, mm -hmm. indenture. And furthermore, the Aqua Center's charter, uh, Tom, said that it would be available to all residents of the village on an equitable basis. And uh, what we wanted to do is to assure that it would remain in the hands of people who would continue those policies and pay off the remaining debt to the bondholders. So uh, when the Y took it on, uh, it was with the express understanding, uh, somehow in the discussion we use the phrase soul, but it was simply a transfer. They simply acquired the, the assets and the obligations of the Aqua Center. It was a not-for-profit organization, so none of the board members had any financial so no stake. Consideration, right. No consideration, right. no financial right. All we want to do is see that it was in responsible right. hands. And then uh, from then on, Tom, it was between the Y and the village. And they, John, they, if you could pick it up there, I don't know how right. you, you guys got together well, eventually. Well, uh, as I say, the, the initial contact was for purposes of seeing if we could help correct some of the problems that we had with the Aqua Center and that raised concern among the members. Uh, so there were several meetings and, and uh, the village's first involvement was not with any intent to purchase but with an intent to try to help out if we could uh, take care of some of the problems that we had at the site. Uh, later on then in 82, I think it was probably in almost uh, December of 82, uh, 
we started to hear rumors that the Y was not planning to reopen the Aqua Center for the 1983 season. Uh, and so obviously the village uh, got much more interested and much more concerned uh, had they been, at had, that time. Had they been paying off the bonds, incidentally? They had paid off the bonds uh, that were members would request their $100 back, and they were, they were paying them off, yes. Uh, so once that rumor surfaced, we tried to check that out. And I don't know, some of you may recall that in, at that very time, in 82 and 83, the YMCA of Metropolitan Chicago was undergoing a, a major kind of a reorganization of its operation, yeah. and yeah. a cutback movement was, uh, uh, was underway. And, and they were taking and kind of identifying some of what they considered to be their losers. And, in trying to uh, make some major changes. Uh, they were building new facilities on the one hand and they were getting out of other arrangements on the other hand where they weren't really continuing to provide the services that they originally. And so the Aqua Center was caught up in that, basically. There had not been uh, any significant physical improvements to the site and, you know, for the most part during the 10 years that they operated it, but particularly during the last five years. Uh, they had not put money into it to keep it up. So uh, when those rumors surfaced that they were not probably going to open it, uh, that's when we went to them right away and tried to find out what the deal was. And uh, in early 1983, they, they admitted, yes, in fact, they were not planning to open the facility for the summer. Uh, so obviously, from a village standpoint, you envision all kinds of you know, a big boarded up place or, or five empty pools with uh, weeds growing up between the cracks and and the most prominent location there is in the village. And uh, so that was a situation that that we knew just could not be tolerated in this community. Uh, and so the discussions got very serious then about, uh, about our taking it over in some way, shape, or form, whether it be uh, buying it, and other alternatives were, were uh, also discussed, are operating it and let them continue to own it. But in any event, the, the first and foremost objective was to make sure it was open and operating in 83. Uh, things moved rather quickly then. And uh, in March, in the end of March in 1983 was when the board actually voted to purchase it. I think it was around March 30th. And we did a uh, we had to do a lot of research because we had not operated pools before and to try to figure out financially how the village was going to come out, come out on the deal and that type of thing. And we prepared a, a report which was considered at the time. Uh, and on April 15th, I think it was April 15th or April 16th, we closed on the deal uh, when the village purchased the facility. It was really the first time that we were able to go in and do anything to start getting the place ready, and obviously it was in, and it, it was in pretty bad shape, and we had to be open by the 9th of June was the was the opening day. Uh, so we, one of the things we did is we went back to some of the old practices of the uh, of the Aqua Center board, and uh, the first thing we did since we knew this was going to be a major project, major crash project uh, of the village is we went to all our employees and we told the hundred and some employees of the village that this was the situation, the pool wasn't going to open, that it would be a, a disaster for our community if it didn't, and we had to do something as a village to make sure it did, and would they, would they consider uh, help the seriousness of this matter and helping out with it. Uh, all the employees as a group each agreed to donate a half a day's time to spend in some way, shape, or form getting the facility ready and that would include uh, public works people in the plumbing area and we had fire and police and the clerical staff here helping with whatever they could do cleaning up the place landscaping uh, from this as i understand this was the, they donated their time right mm -hmm. for uh, on the order of half a day half a day per person the group committed daily for their, their no just one, one one each employee was asked to contribute uh six hours time uh, uh, six hours of volunteer time to get help us get get the place ready obviously the parks department staff were paid and they we were working you know that's all we did for uh, two months that particular year almost uh, so that effort then was followed up with kind of a uh, appeal to the community and and that was 
worked pretty nice because right after the acquisition, then we were able to say, hey, if anybody is willing to come in and help out, clean this place up, whatever, do it. And we had a tremendous turnout of people who were willing to come in and grab a hose and scrub down and and uh, and do that type of thing. So, uh, so what's that unusual about us? that in Park Forest? That's right, that's right. And it, again, it was kind of a throwback to the way the whole thing was built, and that was necessary in order for us to to get it open. And uh, I know the first day, I remember on the uh, Friday evening before Saturday opening, we were there until about 3 o'clock in the morning getting the last <laughs> last pieces of the puzzle put together. But uh, we had a real hot summer, the first summer in 83, so we had a terrific summer uh, revenue-wise and use-wise and uh, and that type of thing. Uh, so it's, re it's really worked out very well for us. I think the point of controversy at the meeting uh, as part of the financial... Of the, of the 83 meeting when right, you decided right. to buy it from the Y? When we decided to buy it at the Y, one of the recommendations we had in there, and it goes back to, again, the debate in 74, was that we had to continue the season pass, the season pass type of uh, operation. So we, we knew we were going to get our revenue up front. Uh, we did at that time propose a daily fee for the first time, but the daily fee was quite high, and uh, that kind of helped take care of both, but it was high enough for if you were going to swim a few times a year, you were going to buy a daily pass mm -hmm. anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, the largest pool, the what used to be called the, the teen tall beginner pool, I guess, uh, there were major physical problems with that pool, and they were losing 36,000 gallons a, a day. Uh, was leaking out of that pool. And again, there was one of the situations where they just continued to try to operate it, the Y did, and, and that problem wasn't addressed. Uh, we looked at population in the area, past sales, and what the price was. I think at the time, the, the Y, the last year they operated, the pass was a, about $180 or $185 for a family. Mm -hmm. uh, so the price was really getting up there, and I think that led to people being concerned when they didn't think they were getting the right service or the right kind of upkeep and that type of thing. John, uh, our, our population aging also had some factor in it, I assume. That's right. Uh, we were at the peak uh, in 1973, uh, 33,000 population. Uh, in 1983, we were uh, 26,000. Uh, we had closed. Uh, six schools in our community. Sure. Uh, <coughs> there were pools built around us in other communities. Uh, new apartment complexes had pools. Uh, the Burnside subdivision in Rich Richton Park has its own pool operated by a homeowner so association. So uh, we weren't the only game in town anymore. Mm -hmm. The population wasn't the same. The number of children was, uh, you know, it maybe half of what it was before. Yeah. So. With that major physical problem we had with that pool, and just looking at the numbers, what we did is we compared the numbers here with some of the other municipal pools in the area. John, how is the attendance this year of 100 degree days that we've had, particularly this month of, of June? It's been very good, obviously. <laughs> uh, uh, we've had some real big days so far this year. We still have a policy of if it's going to be a real big day, we put out a no daily fee today mm -hmm. sign. Mm -hmm. And we do not mm -hmm. sell daily fees if we know we're going to be crowded mm -hmm. with our, our pass holders. Mm -hmm. So we continue to try to give them definitely top priority. Uh, going back to the meeting, I think the major issue then at that meeting was part of the package that was presented to the village board to buy and purchasing the site was closing down that big pool. Yep. And we filled it in and sided it over, and I think that led to a lot of the controversy at the time. What was the dollar consideration for the village acquiring? Oh, that would mean a major overhaul, as I recall. Yes, it? that would have been... It's almost you know, 30 years old. I think that, that would have been a million dollar project there. Yeah, if you just for that one pool. Yeah, yeah. 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 But with the changing demographics, as, as John mentioned, you still have the original beginner's pool, the adult pool is still an adult pool, yes. and then the intermediate pool. So That's you right. still have more swimming space than most other communities. Many of which, by the way, sent delegations to us. We were, we were um, not only a not-for-profit organization, we were not-for-profit consultants for them. <laughs> John, I think it's very interesting what you've been telling us about taking over this operation and causing it to be perpetuated this very day and into the future.
<laughs> so I want to know more about this, and you continue on, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, one of the things I notice of interest here, I mentioned that the Y, uh, when they last operated, I think their season pass rate was uh, $185 or something like that for a season pass. Part of this package also, what we presented to the board for the first year were the included the rates. And uh, we reduced the rates. The first year, the season pass was $75 for a family. At the early bird, the same as uh, Aqua Center used to, has always done, we had an early bird rate. And uh, I thought it was kind of interesting because looking at this literature from the 1964 uh, PR presentation, well, the season, season pass is uh, 50, years, 50 and $60. So we've increased $20 in 20 years, which uh, which I don't think is too bad. The early bird saved ten dollars. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as far as our operations since then, we really have. Uh, it's been a good facility, and the attendance has been, you know, terrific. As I as I mentioned before, uh, I thought it was interesting that you me mentioned the debates over the country club uh, oh, atmosphere gosh, and that uh, type of thing because. It's uh, times have changed, and people yeah. all have air conditioning now, That's and right. uh, there's more of a tendency to buy a pass and send the kids to the Aqua sure. Center than for the whole family to come for the Aqua Center. So, most of the improvements that we've made, in addition to basically just scaling down the size of the facility, uh, the improvements we've made in the last uh, five years have been to try to get the families back, and we've tried to go to improvements that uh, are consistent with what the country club would do. Uh, we've taken out a lot of the uh, concrete and uh, we've replaced that with plants and trees and landscaping and built decks and we've tried to make the area around the east pool, which is what we call the adult pool now, more exclusive feeling so that the adults have a more of a feeling of a country club type situation because uh, we are essentially with that facility completing in kind of a private market. There's a lot of things that sure. those can do, a lot of other facilities and other activities they can go to, and this has to have all the amenities and all those feelings of a nice place to be, a country club type thing that they're going to look for elsewhere. So our improvements have been in that area is to try to make it more uh, a country clubish, if you uh -huh. may. John, do you make it available, as, as we did, um, to private groups, generally those within the village, but sometimes groups outside the village who want to rent the Aqua Center, let's say, for an evening, a splash party or a, a get-together or whatever. We do uh, real good business in renting it out for private parties, all uh -huh. the different kind of parties, and uh, we'll, we rent it to anybody. I mean, our market basically is whoever is sure. willing to buy a pass or, or come in and wants to rent the facility because yeah. uh, we need now more than the village population to really yeah. support the size of the facility. Well, there was a change in feeling, too, over the years. As I recall, uh, uh, most of the early residents of Park Forest had uh, come from more settled communities where there were existing facilities. And uh, here they're thrown into a brand new community, and um, they were confronted with uh, the need for do-it-yourselfism. There was nobody around to give them all these goodies. They had to go out and build them and finance them and so on. And I think we've come full cycle, haven't we, uh, John, with... Uh, Villages, communities today uh, actually using the device of a revenue bond issue. Isn't that pretty close to the way the Aqua Center evolved? Those who use it pay for it. Those who don't use it are not taxed for it. And we accept that today as, as a perfectly acceptable way of doing things. But um, to try to sell that idea to the village 35 years ago, it, it was uh, took some doing. <laughs> took some, a lot of meetings, <laughs> a lot of coffee clutching. Outdoor <laughs> swimming pools are still... Uh, heavily tax supported and, and I would sure. say that we have been able to operate it on a break-even basis and we've been able to pay off our debt but uh, that is highly uncommon in the state of Illinois. Most park districts outside pools are still subsidized with taxes so uh, you know, John, what, do you, so what do you see to the future? What do you see to the future here both in terms of the Aqua Center itself and the application of this principle that you've outlined uh, the both of you have outlined for future unanticipated presently needs of park mm -hmm. forest? Well, uh, I have some great concerns over the work that needs to be done, uh, but I also have, I, I also feel there are some just exciting opportunities out there uh, to continue in the same method of operation and to, uh, you know, remodel of facilities and that type of thing. Uh, aquatics today are 
much, much different than they were in the 50s and 60s when these pools were built. If you're familiar with the pools, basically rectangular shape, uh, many things at that time patterned after the Olympic size pool and the competitive swimming and, and so most of the pools and most of the facilities there are, are patterned after more of a competitive swimming and a swim lesson type situation. Uh, the uh, truly exciting things that are happening these days in aquatics and many municipal operations are getting into them again to attract users are in the more water park related features. Uh, uh, water slides and zero depth pools, which is instead of having a straight side, it comes right up to like it would a beach. Uh, man so you can man walk, made waves that's that right. they got up in Canada. Well, you Singapore. can walk right in the water. <laughs> yeah, they well, surf in some of those sure, sure, yeah. <laughs> shopping center pools. Uh, all kinds of uh, special water features for little kids. Uh, and we have a master plan for the Aqua Center site that uh, does envision a lot of those things, which would allow us again to increase the number of users to produce more revenue from the users and to pay off those improvements. Uh, our problem is getting to a position of where we're going to get that money some way up front. And uh, that's, that's a problem right now. The village budget is tough and so we're having a very difficult time in coming up with you know, public tax monies to do that. But the opportunity is there with that facility if it were modernized with some of the things that are going on now in aquatics. Uh, I think it could be a showpiece. It could really, and it could bring in us a lot more revenue, which we need. Has anyone suggested the device of a uh, of a locally issued, um, uh, a locally floated uh, bond issue? We talked about revenue this bond again. issue. Yeah, we have talked about this again. Uh, the banks really don't like a, re a revenue bond anymore for these types uh -huh. of things, particularly if you're a village. Uh, they just soon have the full faith and credit of the uh, of the community. So, uh, there, the the revenue bond thing had its cycle in, in Illinois with uh, tennis clubs and ice arenas and some cases indoor swimming pools, but uh, many of them were tougher goals than the uh, feasibility studies would indicate, so uh, the revenue bond kind of had its peak and it's kind of peaked out now, and they like the full faith and credit of the village taxpayers. John, you ran into the same problem <laughs> we did as a private not-for-profit corporation. Uh, we, we had some conversations with the banks, but um, uh, we finally learned that we had to do it on our own. We did get some help in the early days, I forgot to mention, and I, I should uh, give credit where it's due, certainly, and if I fail to do so at all in this discussion, it was an oversight, not by intent, believe me. We did get a loan from Marshall Field and Goldblatt's in the initial financing of the Aqua Center, $15,000 a piece. And we turned down a gift, an offer of a gift from the developer. We said, thank you, but no thanks. We want to be independent. If we, if we start being obliged to you and obliged to someone else, we're not going to have our, our independence. We went back a year or two later and paid off Marshall Field and Goldblatt. And you could literally hear their jaws flap open. Here's a not-for-profit group coming back and repaying a loan before it was even due. They were five-year notes, as I remember, just to get it was bridge financing. And we said, well, we're proud of our operation, and we thank you for your help. But we, um, we want to feel that we, we did it ourselves. So <laughs> uh, you're going to the banks is, is very similar. But um, if you've got proven usage, uh, I think you wouldn't have any problem uh, selling a revenue bond right within the village, John. Well, so, again, we have talked about that, the going sure. to the selling. Uh, I think bonds. the public has accepted the fact that, that they're willing to pay. You can't do it with school. You can't do it with yeah. other uh, necessary things, fire, police. I'm not sure. suggesting that. But there are certain kinds of facilities which now nationwide uh, are supported through the use of user mm -hmm. fees. Um, back in your court. I do want to discuss the yeah. photographs yeah. a little bit. Uh -huh. um, if you could close in on this one, I'd just like to show some. Not everyone has been here all along. Um, show where the pool was in relation to the housing in the village. This is an early photograph, I believe, probably 54, 55. And um, it's before Orchard Drive was put in. Okay. Um, and then if Mr. Martin would look at the top picture, the small one. Um, Orchard Drive is 
is not here. This looks like where it did finally come in, but it looks like it's being used as a parking area almost here. What was... Uh, north of the Aqua Center, that was the parking lot. Yeah, above here. Um, was there a drive? Was there a road of some sort that that's went... That's Orchard. Okay, oh, but yeah. Orchard didn't go to North Orchard yet. Orchard at that time, I don't think, went all the way through. I'm not sure how far it, north it went. Uh, I don't think it was paved it for some time Westwood, after was that way? the Yakka okay, Center. It might have stopped at Westwood, right. Mm -hmm. uh, I know the village requirements were pretty tough on us. We had to put in concrete, uh, iron-reinforced driveways before the village had access roads that the public could use to get to us. But uh, it, it, uh, it got built got used. I might say we've taken out some of that concrete you put in and it was very sturdy. Three feet deep <laughs> I'll have you. Well reinforced. We, we wrung our hands over the cost of, involved in that, but um, it held up. And I, I didn't hear any discussion. You have a duplicate of this one too. There's a sandy play area next to it. Yeah. Um, Describe that. I this again was uh, a result of coffee clatching uh, committee discussions and uh, uh, the women decided that uh, it would be a good idea to have a sand area for the little toddlers. Uh, first they would uh, use the splash pool, but those a little older that the parents could uh, feel safe in letting them be on their own, they liked nothing better than building sand piles. So that again was a result of committee work. Okay. And if you look at the pile of photographs, is there anything else that you might like to discuss for a minute? Well, here are, um, here's a pool with diving, and as John said, uh, building anything today, you, you've got to take into account uh, the needs and requirements demographically of your population. Uh, some people who like to dive would have loved to have every pool with a diving board. Well, you simply can't do it. it it's not mm -hmm. uh, cost effective. Was this the one, Jane, that you had yeah, in I mind? I just wondered any of the, any of the All right. This was the, um, uh, the finished uh, bathhouse. And um, uh, compared to the original open-air dressing rooms, we felt it was positively <laughs> luxurious. I don't know how it's held up over time. Um, would you like me to run through some of these others here? Uh, uh, well, this one shows some of the sidewalks okay. being built. That's, just a minute, let's let him close in and get it. And um, this is a very good shot of the early days of the Olympic-sized pool with the diving on one end. Um, we had to be very careful about the other pools to uh, um, not have diving because they were too shallow. That's a special hopper, as you know, which is safe enough to dive into. Okay. Uh, another view, uh, Jane, of, sure. of the... Uh, Olympic-sized pool, which was the initial large pool, now that's closed up. And uh, as John mentioned, uh, demographically, the village doesn't need that anymore. So over a 30-year period, when you have a big operation and the total facility is all paid for, we had to worry privately about paying off bonded indebtedness. Mm -hmm. John's job, I think, today <laughs> is to worry about maintaining the facility and simply replacing uh, portions of it as, as they become... Uh, uh, too old to maintain uh, cost effectively sometime you did the wise thing with that big pool just shut it down mm -hmm. are you thinking of replacing any of these uh, in the future well maybe uh, the mechanical systems the filter systems and pumping systems uh -huh. uh, need uh, need work and probably the top pool which was built in 1954 needs to be almost completely replaced because we have a lot of trouble with the walls concrete okay. on the walls each year uh, have yeah. to be repaired John uh, the Water loss. You were having another day. Has, has that had an occurring, been a recurring problem? No, no. We have not had too much of a problem with that with the other pools. We have occasional breaks. We'll have, uh, you know, some kind of a problem each spring when we go to open a pipe break underground or uh, pipes that are rusted and we have to replace. But uh, nothing major that's ongoing in terms of a problem. But all the equipment is really in need of uh, refurbishing, particularly me mechanical equipment. If you needed help from um, the citizens in the community, do you, do you feel uh, you'd have more trouble getting that assistance today than we did, say, uh, 30, 35 years ago? Uh, yeah, I think we would. And I think most of the groups and organizations in the village 
uh, recognize that. And it's simply a fact that you know, most families now, both uh, husband and wife work, and uh, there's just a lot of other demands on, on people's time. I think all the organizations in the village have kind of felt that. Uh, yeah. It's more and more difficult to get volunteers. However, we get a good project in this town, and you still get some tremendous talent behind it, and uh, a lot of the things that we do are still done sure. because of that volunteer spirit and cooperation. Well, Tom, who was with a developer in the early days, um, must remember the time somewhere is in your literature, I believe, that Park Forest had the highest uh, educational level or graduate degree level of expertise in many, many different professions and skills, and that, a good pool that of people was a to draw. Continuing during my uh, regime, uh, and I, I've had two separate stints for the uh, as director of uh, management of the finally 3,022 rental townhouse units mm -hmm. and the several shopping complexes. Uh, it, uh, uh, you know, I've come back to Park Forest after being away for 23 years. I came back in 85 and bought a home on Central Park, uh, and I certainly like what I see out there, and I don't have to mow it. <laughs> <laughs> I would just like to add that um, the library does have copies of these reports. Now, if anyone's interested in studying the history of the Aqua Center or the history of the village taking it over. And, um, and any scholars that are present in the community, I think it'd be a good master's thesis. <laughs> <laughs> and we've also just received the kind donation of these uh, larger excerpts from newspapers that uh, John Joyce has been storing and we'll now have those. And our, our photographs are available for people wishing to see what we've been talking about at closer range. It's good to hear and be refreshed on what has happened here. It's good to look to the future also. Good to have you together. Well, thank you for having me out. This was an exercise in Nostalgiaville, but I <laughs> enjoyed every bit of it because we can all look back with uh, a lot of pride and satisfaction for our involvement. And uh, thank you, John, for your uh, understanding and the negotiations initially with the Aqua Center, and then there was a hiatus when the Y <laughs> took it, and then finally the village and everybody got together. So yeah, it's, it's worked fun. out, I think, to everyone's advantage. And thank you, Jane, for your good contribution.